in there, Ben? Great. Um, so, as Kathleen said there in the introduction, I, I'm Don McKinnon, I'm Chair of the Scottish Crofting Federation. Um, just a, a qu very quickly a bit about the Federation. Um, we're a membership organisation um, and we are the only organisation that's solely dedicated to representing the interests of crofters and crofting and we do that in a number of ways. Um, we do um, a bit of lobbying work. Um, making sure that crofters interests are represented in the in the parliament um, and with other uh, relevant organizations we also run a, a training project um, and offer training courses for crofters um, and all of this work uh, we, do, we do lots of other things as well but i won't go into all the detail you can find out more on our website um, but all of this work that we do is um, funded through our membership um, and we are a membership organisation fundamentally um, and we have about 2,000 members at the moment um, from across the crofting counties and beyond. Um, so that's that's a, a little bit about SCF before I get into my presentation. So you can go to the next slide now, Ben. Okay, so... I'm assuming that everybody on the call knows what crofting is, so I'm not going to go into any detail about that. But it is a, a form of land tenure that's unique to the Highlands and Islands and it is very prominent in the Outer Hebrides. Um, so just a few stats about what crofting looks like in the Outer Hebrides. We, we have over 6,000 crofts. And those crofts are organised into uh, townships that, for the most part, each have their own common grazings. Um, so that there are, and there are 269 individual common grazings in the Outer Hebrides, and in total that makes about makes up about 77 percent of the land area. So it's clear from these statistics that if we're going to do anything um, with the land in in our area to mitigate climate change, to do anything in relation to uh, climate change. We're going to need buy-in from crofters, and and I would argue we're actually going to need crofters to be leading on that. Um, so it's it, this discussion that we're having today is a really important one um, for how uh, organisations, whether that be community land trusts, uh, community other community groups, and and just the people of the Outer Hebrides can tackle the, the climate issue. So. What, what do crofters do in the in in our area? For the most part, we are rearing store sheep and cattle. So crofters have um, flocks of breeding sheep and breeding cows that produce young stock every year, which are for the most part sold off island to um, better land on farmers with better land on the mainland and um, right the way down to south of England um, to be finished and then enter the food chain. Um, there's also a bit of uh, sale of breeding stock as well goes on, um, with particularly um, breeding cattle being quite sought after for their health status. Um, so, so some meat is produced as well um, for local sale. We're lucky to have a, a good abattoir in Stornoway um, that services the community and uh, it's increasingly local butchers um, taking more interest in stocking, um, stocking island produced meat which we'd love to see more of. Um, so food production is a really, still a really important part of crofting. And, and even that, um, that production of store livestock is still very uh, closely linked to um, the, the, the food system. There's also been a resurgence in growing fruit and veg. Um, so this is obviously something that was in the, in the past was very, very, a very important part of crofting um, uh, historically. Um, but, but maybe um, fell away a bit um, in the intervening period, but there seems to be a lot more in interest in people growing their own food, uh, their, their own fruit and veg, and, and actually marketing it and selling it. Um, in particular, people putting up polycrubs um, more and more. So th there's definitely a growing sector there. And there's also an increasing interest in diversification, whether that's pods or uh, tourism, but we probably won't go into that too much today. Um, this picture here uh, was taken on the 11th of April, I think it was, um, and the reason I included it was, this is kind of showing that whether this is to climate change or not, who knows, but crofters are at the forefront of experiencing a changing climate, and um, 
heavy snow like this at the beginning of lambing was was actually quite catastrophic for some flocks. Luckily, it didn't last long, uh, and I just started lambing at this point. Um, but we experience it. We experience extreme weather um, all the time, and and have to cope with it and and mitigate against it. So, um, you can go to the next slide now, Ben. So, what's the problem with agriculture when it comes to the climate? Um, you can't really turn on the TV or open a newspaper without reading something um, that talks about cattle and sheep being a big part of the um, the problem when it comes to emissions. Um, and I just want to talk a wee bit about why that's the case and, and how, as a crofting industry, we can respond to that. So, Agriculture is estimated to currently contribute a quarter of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, those emissions are made up of uh, three, three main types. We've got carbon dioxide, um, which is mainly produced um, through, it'll be through things like machinery, transport and industrial processes. So for uh, for crofting, we're probably not doing too badly around that. We're, we're not as mechanised as some other forms of agriculture um, and our emissions there would be lower. doesn't mean we can't improve, but um, we're starting from a good point there, I think. Uh, the other, the second um, biggest emitter is uh, nitrous oxides. So these are um, produced when fertilisers come into contact with the soil, um, inorganic and organic fertilisers. Um, and again, in crofting, um, we, we have um, pretty targeted use of these um, fertilizers. Uh, it's not as widespread as it is in, in other forms of agriculture. So again, we're probably doing a bit better than some more intensive models. Um, again, area to improve on. Um, the big one for us is, is methane production. Um, as I said, crofting in the Outer Hebrides is predominantly um, based around uh, livestock and cattle and sheep. So uh, when um, this, this, is a, this is a natural process, the production of methane from um, ruminant livestock, cattle, sheep, and other, other ruminants, when they, they are eating um, grass and heather and things like that that are um, made, off, made up of uh, carbon, and they are, they are, they're eating that, they're digesting it, and as part of that digestion process, that enteric fermentation, they are producing methane gas, which is emitted. Now, that's part of a carbon cycle where that methane um, exists in the atmosphere um, breaks down into uh, CO2 and is then uh, absorbed by grass and plants in, in, um, to, and the cycle is completed. But the problem is when, if livestock numbers increase as they have done globally, um, that has a warming impact. It's not a closed cycle anymore, um, and methane levels uh, can increase. Um, obviously, it's worth noting that that increase in livestock numbers hasn't happened in uh, in Scotland or particularly in the Outer Hebrides, where livestock numbers have declined a lot in recent years. Um, so, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's much more powerful than CO two in terms of its warming impact. But as I've just said, it doesn't persist in the atmosphere. It, it breaks down over a period of about 12 years um, into CO2. So how we actually measure that warming impact of methane is really important to uh, how we base policy decisions and, uh, and business decisions are around this. Um, so the modeling currently uses a, a formula called uh, Global Warming Potential 100. Um, which bases the warming potential of methane over a period of 100 years. So that doesn't quite tie in with methane breaking down over a period of 12 years. Um, and there is some, some work come out of Oxford University on a, a, a new way of measuring it called GWP star, which would better um, recognize the true warming impact of methane and that process of it breaking down in the atmosphere. Now, the reason I mentioned this isn't to suggest that there's this is some sort of get out of jail free card for agriculture, and I'm not suggesting that the science on this is in any way wrong. 
but the way that we interpret it and the way that we deal with it is really important because um, what we're talking about here is is um, an industry that is that is is very very important to communities like ours, um, and as I'll go on to talk about um, biodiversity as well. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Ben. So. Um, Biodiversity, where does this come into the mix here? So as well as the climate emergency, we are experiencing a biodiversity crisis. We are losing um, species and habitat at an um, alarming rate across the world um, and, and even in the UK and in Scotland. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about how that interacts with the climate debate. So. This picture, for example, here um, is my sheep moving between crofts uh, in the summer months. Um, they're not; they're just moving through this area. They're not actually grazing there, although there's a few having a wee nibble. Um, but this this area of grass down at the shore, it's not quite macker, but it's um, you would call it species-rich grassland, maybe. And the way we manage this is to improve its biodiversity. So this area needs to be grazed by livestock in the, in, the, in the winter months to get rid of all the old vegetation to allow the grasses and the flowers to come up in the summer months. And it produces this uh, amazing carpet of wildflowers um, that just wouldn't exist without grazing by livestock and managed grazing by livestock, which is the, uh, a really crucial point. So grazing livestock are essential to maintaining habitat for many of our um, most endangered plant and, and bird species. Um, so birds like our waders um, rely on livestock um, and uh, corn crakes as well, which we all know are, are so endangered, also rely on livestock to um, improve the habitat for them. So if, if we think about what I was talking about in the previous slide and the emissions related to livestock, on paper, you know, if you were going to make a decision on right, right the warming is the is the big problem here. We need to just cut our emissions uh, overnight. Um, that would do massive damage to biodiversity in this country and in particular in 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 our, in our communities, um, bec because livestock are essential to the, maintaining these habitats. So focusing on emissions alone could pose a threat to biodiversity. And we need to take both of these crises very seriously uh, and deal with both of them in a, in a measured way. Next slide, please, Ben. So what would a sustainable future for crofting look like? Well, we need to keep producing high quality food. Um, and we also need to keep producing public goods as well. So uh, the elephant in the room here is the the support that crofters and farmers receive from government. And how that support is targeted is, um, is going to be crucial to how we deal with these challenges going forward. And it's becoming increasingly clear from government that, um, that climate and particularly greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity are going to be central to how these payments are based in the future. We've come out of the common agricultural policy. So it's up to um, our own governments to um, come up with a, a, how they are going to deliver agricultural policy going forward. Um, and uh, as SCF, and, uh, we are, we're engaged in that process and um, making sure that the interests of crofters are represented in that. Um, so there's two, there's two main ways that crofting and wider agriculture um, can contribute around emissions um, and greenhouse gases. First one is, is to reduce emissions. So my first point there is around efficiency. Now, sometimes efficiency can be confused with intensification. That's not, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So efficiency in this case, we're talking about getting the same from less. So not increasing production, keeping production the same, but put, using less inputs. Um, so trying to do it with less artificial fertilizer, for example, uh, less uh, grain, 
perhaps, and relying more on what we actually have uh, as a resource in front of us in terms of grass and, um, and homegrown fodder uh, for our livestock. Um, and, and that has the potential to reduce emissions a bit, not massively, but, um, but enough to make a difference. But then we have emerging technologies, and this is where the Scottish government are um, resting a lot of hope um, on um, the ability to reduce um, methane emissions. And that's through the use of methane inhibitors, which are feed additives that actually reduce the amount of methane that an animal is producing. Um, by uh, affecting, the, I don't know the technical uh, aspects of it, but by affecting their, uh, their digestion without compromising on performance. So there's been, there was an announcement at COP26 that uh, the Scottish government were investing in a, in a facility um, in the central belt that's going to be producing one of these feed additives. There's some, there's some already on the market, although they're not licensed as methane inhibitors, they're, they're just, um, they're, they're uh, classified as something else to allow them to sell it but it's it's not quite there yet but that's one to watch and then the other the the, the other way that we can deal with this is sequestration now i'm not going to do it go into too much detail about this because ben's got a great slide that explains it uh, in more detail but this is basically the removal of co2 from the atmosphere um and um, and land use can do that and that's the most i think that's that's really the most exciting bit of um uh, the, this whole process for, for crofting. So the first uh, example of doing sequestration is improved grassland management. That actually links in with efficiency as well, um, because if we, if we improve how we use our grassland and how, how we graze our areas, we can actually uh, get more out of them and then increase efficiency. But if we, give, if we graze in a certain way on certain soil types, we can actually um, start building soil which removes CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, woodland creation, we all know about the benefits of trees, um, but the trees have to be in the right place. Um, there's, um, there's little to be gained from planting trees on peatland, for example. Um, that's where peatland restoration comes in. Um, but there is a place for trees um, in, in some areas as uh, providing shelter for livestock and, and obviously providing the benefits of trees, um, but integrating them into agricultural systems is, has massive potential to benefit both, um, both traditional crofting and um, uh, getting that additional sequestration through woodland creation. And, and finally, um, peatland restoration, which Ben is going to talk about in a lot more detail, but um, I think it's really important um, when we talk about peatland restoration that we're aware that Peatland restoration isn't about replace, isn't about land use change as such. It's it's about improving the land that is there, and then uh, continuing to use that for um, agriculture. So this this area, this photo shows uh, this is my brother helping me out moving our um, hogs out onto the the moor in April time, and this digger is Ben's uh, peatland restoration project on the go in our township. Now this area won't be fenced off or anything, it will continue to be grazed by sheep. We'll keep a very close eye on, uh, on, on the impact that they're having and making sure that they're not doing damage, but this will continue to be crofting land um, and our common grazing isn't benefiting financially in any way from this, we're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, across the causeway there we've got our, an old forestry plantation planted in the 90s which wouldn't happen today. Um, this would be classed as an inappropriate place to plant trees. But you know, you see in this in this picture, you, uh, this is a receding as well behind it. You've got lots of different land uses going on there, and they're all contributing something. Um, and we can do them all together um, to enhance both um, our, our climate impact, but also um, making sure that we're not losing sight of biodiversity as well. So I'll hand over to. Ben there, um, and happy to answer any questions on any of that at the end. Thanks. I just wanted to check with Kathleen, are you wanting to pause now for questions or are you happy for me to continue? Um, you Whatever works for <laughs> yourself. So if it, maybe since it's both in the same presentations, if you can keep going and then we'll just open it up after. Thanks. No problem. Um, Thanks, Donald. Um, so for those of you who haven't met me yet or don't know me, I'm Ben. 
uh, as uh, Kathleen said in the introduction, I'm the Peatland Action Project Officer uh, for the Outer Hebrides. Uh, I also work with Hura Sarah Carlawai, um, but my remit's for the whole of the Outer Hebrides. So uh, I will sort of cover the basics of uh, peatlands and what, who we are as peatland action and what we hope to achieve and sort of take you on a whistle stop tour over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so about peatland action and what we've been doing. So uh, looking forward to speaking with you in questions as well at the end. So beginning uh, with what are peatlands, it's quite a, a straightforward question for where we are based up in the Outer Hebrides. You look out your window and you're almost guaranteed to see a peatland, um, but they are the ecosystems which are supported uh, and to deposit peat. Uh, the peatlands may not be currently forming peat, they may be eroding and may have a, a broken coverage of vegetation on the top, um, but the sort of the basic definition is, is it a landscape that has peat underneath the, the vegetation layer there? So um, we've got a, a photo here which you may be familiar with, is uh, taken in the Lewis Peatlands SPA, so the the blanket bog looking out uh, in the north of Lewis uh, and we're talking about the, the vegetation as well so the vegetation mix in a peatland is, is crucial so we're talking about uh, sphagnum mosses, cotton grasses generally and, and, and heathers as well um, and other plants like this sundew here on the right hand side as well the small carnivorous plant uh, the venus flytrap of our peatlands so these these things are all uh, found on our peatlands and, 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 and key indicators um, but why are we bothering to restore our peatland uh, is a question I get off, uh, oft, <laughs> often asked. Um, roughly 20% of Scotland is classifiable as peatlands or peat soil. So the map on the right hand side here shows the concentration. So the, the darker the colour it is, the sort of more carbon rich uh, the soil uh, is the peatland is. This is an old map, so excuse the boxes around the, the islands as well. But that's technically illegal now, I think. So we'll try and get an updated one. Um, but roughly a fifth of Scotland is, is peat or peat, peatlands or peat soil. Um, and 50 to 80 percent of that is classifiable as being in a degraded or a damaged state. Um, now that, roughly speaking, we have four categories: uh, actively eroding, drained, modified, near natural. So it fits somewhere on that scale. Um, and our peatlands are are really important, especially in the climate uh, emergency that we find ourselves in just now. Our, our peatlands in Scotland hold 140 years worth of our greenhouse gas emissions. So. If we allow these systems to erode and to release their greenhouse gases, we are exponentially uh, increasing the damage that we are doing. Uh, so by restoring them, we're hoping to turn these systems around from being a, a source of carbon or greenhouse gases and making them a sink for the greenhouse gases. So trapping them under the vegetation layer in the soil uh, for future generations and to, to, to try and protect that. Um, a brief overview of who we are as Peatland Action. Uh, so we are a Scottish government funded program of projects. Uh, I work for the Nature Scott uh, arm of the project, um, but there are other partners, including the National Parks, Forestry Land Scotland, Scottish Water as well. Um, and we are looking to restore uh, Scotland's damaged peatlands. So we've been set the target of 250,000 hectares of, of peatland to restore. Um, Restoration doesn't finish the moment machines or, or labourers or uh, materials are taken off site. The restoration can take 5, 10, 15, 20 years to come to completion. What we're doing is we're doing the interventions, the mitigations to try and turn the peatland systems around from eroding to try to recover to then hopefully being a healthy and active system into the future. Um, since 2012, the Nature Scott Peatland Action Project has been working on over 250 projects now. Uh, we've covered 25,000 hectares, so we've got a long way to go to meet our target. Um, and as I said there, uh, peatlands are, that are in a good health have a huge potential to store carbon for us, to be these carbon stores and sinks. But there's other benefits as well that are associated with a healthy and active peatland. Donald's touched on a few of them as well, and I'll, I'll go into a few more uh, just coming up. So the most obvious uh, gain from having a healthy and active peatland at the moment is in tackling climate change. Uh, apologies for this slide being a bit wordy in, in the diagram, but this is to give you a, a rough indication of the processes that go on within our peatlands in a healthy and even in a degraded system as well. Uh, this picture is from my colleague Emily Taylor. Uh, there's about nine or so processes that emit greenhouse gases from a peatland, and there's only really two or three that significantly pull them out of the atmosphere. Now, a healthy and active system those processes drawing the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere far outweigh those that are releasing. But I've used this slide just to give you an indicator that even in a healthy system, they can be releasing greenhouse gases. 
it's not a case of we will stop greenhouse gases from being emitted from peatlands. It's a case of trying to slow these down to allow the peatlands to catch up uh, if they've been damaged to catch up and then start capturing it again. So the idea of restoring our peatlands is to try and reduce this impact on uh, on the climate. We have about 25 times the amount of carbon stored in our peatlands than in all the other vegetation within the UK. So that's not just Scotland, that's across the whole UK. So there's huge, huge amounts of greenhouse gases and carbon stored within our peatlands. And this is uh, an, an easy win with peatland restoration once we start restoring our peatlands to, to start tackling this. Another benefit from a healthy and active system is, uh, is actually our local water quality. Um, so in the Outer Hebrides, most of our lochs here are surrounded by peatlands. And if you are working with Scottish water, you will know that they uh, have to then filter and have to treat that water before it's drinkable for us from the tap. So if we have an unhealthy peatland system around these lochs, you will end up with more brown water. Uh, growing up in, in Sutherland, as I did, if there was a storm one night, you would turn the tap on the next morning and there'd be brown water and you would think it was hilarious to brush your teeth with. But in uh, in reality, it's not so good for us to be drinking peaty water all the time. So there's a huge amount that, uh, of energy and, and chemical treatments that need to be done if the water is in a bad condition. So a healthy peatland, means that there's less energy being expended on filtration and treatment and things like this as well. But it's not only for our, uh, our consumption, the water quality as well. The left-hand picture there showing the fish. Uh, having an improved water quality system, either in lochs or rivers that are being fed off our peatlands, it will help improve the, 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 the fish uh, habitats and also the breeding grounds, routes for breeding grounds and things like this. So there's multiple other benefits tied into this water aspect from our peatlands. We've got our, our wildlife, our biodiversity uh, that Donald touched on as well. We have, we are very lucky in the Outer Hebrides to have multiple areas with special designations. Uh, we have things like the black-throated diver, we have uh, eagles, we have various other things that can, uh, that rely on our peatlands. So having an, a, an eroding and degraded system uh, means that we're losing that vegetation, we're losing that habitat, we're potentially losing our wildlife as well. So. Restoring our peatlands, the long-term gain as well, is to promote these habitats, to bring it back, uh, bring back these species. So uh, picture on the left there is me walking around looking at frogs and toads and various other things, um, right the way through to golden plovers uh, and things like this. So we want to, to promote these habitats for that. Also another benefit ties into our use of the peatlands. Uh, so leisure, livestock grazing, as Donald was saying, crofting, field sports, these sorts of things. There, There's a lot that our peatlands can offer us that are not just biodiversity and climate change. Um, if you want to go for a hike across there, the, the picture on the left there is uh, the creation of the, the Bonnet Laird Walk across the, the peatlands of uh, Carlow Estate Trust. A healthy and active system uh, is actually easier to cross than a degraded system with cracks and gullies and, and various other things. So restoring peatland can help, uh, help us to interact with our peatlands again. Um, as well as we're talking about the, improving the habitats and things, if there's uh, estates that are doing stalking and, and shooting and things, then, then that ties into there as well. A negative uh, or a degraded system really does impact on the use of our peatlands. And there are things coming up, not just uh, today, but in years to come as well, where there could be potential future employments and future uh, opportunities with our peatlands. So not just peatland restoration, but other uh, opportunities tied into our peatlands. So having them as in as good a condition as we can get them today, will do us better into the into the future. And I've said there as a future, it's everyone's it's in everyone's interest, not just ourselves here in the Outer Hebrides, but everywhere uh, with the climate emergency that we're facing. It's in everyone's interest to have healthy and active peatlands. There's the men, multiple benefits that are associated with it, um, and it's an internationally recognised cost-effective way of tackling climate change. That's a huge thing at the moment as well in terms of what can we do. You know, is it not? Is it just a case of turning off our, our switches in the evening or recycling our, our, our rubbish and things like this? What else can we do? Well, actually, on our doorstep, we have a, a, a an ecosystem that we can help to restore uh, and, and turn the tide against the release of greenhouse gases. Um, and yeah, if we act now, then it should be in everyone's interest for the future going forward. So touching on that, what can be done? Uh, well, to coin Tesco's phrase, every little helps. If we were to restore an area of degraded peatland about the size of two football pitches, so just, just under one and a half hectares, we could 
move it up a condition category to reduce the emissions from that site by 19 metric tonnes of CO2 a year, which is the equivalent in our terms of uh, 361 running trips from the, the Rodal to the butt of Lewis. So for me, you take off your birthday, Christmas, FA Cup final and Champions League final. Every other day of the year, you'd be driving up and down these islands and you would only just be getting to the same amount of emissions. So for a relatively small area, uh, we can have huge returns uh, from the effort that we put in. And I thought I would just show you a couple of case studies. Uh, Donald's already handedly introduced Arno and his situation for us. Uh, so we've been working over the last few years uh, on a site in Arno uh, in, in partnership with the estate, the common grazings, and then the contractor were, were CalMax uh, Limited. So we initially surveyed uh, about a 30 hectare site uh, uh, Donald's photo here, this is the causeway that was in his photo, uh, and the shelter belt was down here. So this was the site here. After initial surveying, we we, we whittled it down to about 28 hectares, and we, we mapped out just over 20 kilometres worth of peat reprofiling. Now, reprofiling of old peat banks, yes, but also peat hags as well. So erosion, uh, a question I get asked quite often as well is, is it all man's fault that our peatlands are eroding? Yes and no. There are areas where man has certainly had an impact uh, on the erosion of our peatlands, but because of our changing climate, again, here in the Outer Hebrides, that our peatlands are starting to erode because of the conditions we find ourselves in. So we're fighting a losing battle on, on a number of fronts. We need to we need to act now to, to sort of stop this degradation going further. Um, and you can see in this map here, uh, I, I had to give up mapping because the erosion features are so close together. My GPS w w wasn't was, wasn't picking up the difference between the erosion features, so it turned it into one uh, one big blob. Um, but we've been working over the last few years, as I said, to map this area. So this is me, uh, photos from my peat depth survey and vegetation condition survey, uh, looking out uh, down towards the loch uh, and looking at features like old peat banks, but also these peat hags that I was talking about as well. So a peat hag is just a, a standing lump of peat that is eroding around the edges. So this bare peat's being left behind. And this is common. It, once you tune your eye into to our peatlands and you start seeing it either driving by the road or going for a walk across it, this is everywhere across our islands. Um, and and these, are, these are features that we can help to put on the path to restoration. Uh, and again, this is actually along the loch edge was a, an, an old and abandoned peat cutting area. So we're looking at reprofiling these old peat banks. So back in February this year, we were uh, eventually able to get the machines out on site. So this is two of the machines working away in Arnold, uh, looking to reprofile and restore uh, a peatland. I should also say, what do we mean by restoration? So a restoration is about raising and stabilizing the water table. So a peatland is a wetland uh, and the water in a peatland system needs to be between one to sort of two centimetres from the surface. If that water level, water table is not high enough, the peat in the peatland system will start oxidising and eroding and releasing its greenhouse gases. So I should have explained that earlier, sorry. Um, so any, any measures that we use on a restoration project, we're looking to raise the, and stabilise the water table. And if it's a system where, in this instance, there's quite a lot of water in this area, we're looking to slow the flow of the water off the site. So if the water is moving too quickly, uh, even though it's there in a significant uh, volume, if it's moving too quickly across the site, it can be a, a foe to our peatlands as well as a friend. So we want to slow that flow across the system to allow the vegetation to colonise and stabilise uh, the area. So this is the machines working here to do a bit of reprofiling and put in some peat dams to slow the flow of the water. Um, and again, just another uh, photo to give you an example of the lay of the land. So looking down towards uh, Donald's shelter belt that it was in his photo. This machine here is, is having difficulty going over the lumps and bumps, uh, the peat hags that have been left behind. But they start to reprofile them. And then we start to start to see a landscape that looks a bit more akin to this. You can just about make the digger out over here. Uh, this was a, a pathway for water that was flowing down. And these were peat hags in the foreground as well. So these have been reprofiled to allow the vegetation to start colonizing over the bare peat. So previously the, the hag faces would have been near enough uh, vertical. So by reprofiling them to a shallower angle, that will allow vegetation to grow across the bare peat. Um, so the reprofiling allows that to happen. And then we've popped in peat dams as well. So you can just about make out one here. Uh, and then there's a few more down and across the system here. Peat dams is a scary term because people imagine a dam holding back volumes and volumes of water uh, like you would see on uh, well, Scottish water locks for drinking catchments and things. A peat dam isn't necessarily that same sort of a structure. What we're looking to do, as I said, was to slow the flow of the water. So the peat dams will 
barely go above the surface level of the area. So you can see these are tied in or keyed into the edge here and the same down here as well. They're barely higher than the edges of the, the, the peat surface nearby. So the water that's actually pooling here isn't very deep at all. If we were to walk, we could probably walk across this with relative ease. Um, although it looks like deep pools. But the idea here is now where previously this water would have been shooting off down into the loch, this water is now sitting in, in slow uh, slow transit across the site. So it's not stripping the peat particulate, the peat particles off the site, and it's allowing vegetation to come in and colonise those areas that they previously weren't having a chance to. Um, and this is a bit, an after photo as well down by the loch edge, just to give you a bit more of a context. So these are old peat banks that were running into the loch. So again, the faces of these peat banks are being washed, uh, blown into the loch, so uh, affecting the water quality and things. And again, these have been reprofiled to allow the vegetation to grow down over the bare peat. And then hopefully the idea in the years to come is we'll have a carpet of vegetation, uh, which will allow the water table to recover, support a peatland, a peat forming vegetation layer. Uh, and then put it on the pathway to recovery. Another project that we've been working on um, back in 2019 was at Loch Orrissey uh, on the road to Ranish, uh, just about five miles south of Stornoway. Uh, that was in partnership with Ranish Common Grazings with Scottish Water and Soville Estates. And again, uh, CalMax were the, the operators on site for this one. And this is just a couple of quick overview photos to give you an example. So this was an area, the first phase of this site was a heavily uh, peat cutted area. So here's a, a, a bank with quite a wide base. So this, uh, during the rainy season, uh, the rainier times, which we got quite often <laughs> during survey, the peat was being washed down this track and straight into the loch. There was nothing to slow that flow. Um, and you can see here that the peat's drying and cracking and crumbling as well and falling into the base. So after the machine's been on site, this, this face has been reprofiled and the vegetation has been stretched across. And the idea will be that then this vegetation will be able to grow over the top and grow down in the base again. And there shouldn't be any bare peat there uh, left to oxidise and release the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And this is taken from the, the Scottish Water Treatment Works, looking back across to the Ranish Road, heading out towards Stornoway, just a before and after. Uh, there's actually a drain uh, running in between these two old peat banks that was shipping a lot of peat particulate into the loch, as well as the, the old peat banks themselves. So you can still see roughly where these features were, but now there's uh, very little bare peat exposed as they've been covered by uh, the, the machinery uh, pooling the turfs over the top and reprofiling there. So what does our future look like? Um, well, for me personally, we have a number of sites currently in development across uh, the Outer Hebrides. So hoping to get uh, a few projects running in, in the other islands, not just Lewis, um, but in Uist as well. Um, we have had re reaffirmation from the Scottish Government. They are committed to their package of 10-year funding. So the budget before COVID, we were uh, to promised £250 million uh, towards restoration uh, for the next 10 years. The last study has found that to restore all of Scotland's degraded peatland, we need somewhere in the region of four to six billion pounds. So 250 million pounds is, is, is a drop in the ocean, unfortunately, but our task is to try and spend that wisely to tackle as much of the degraded peatland as we can find um, to meet that 250,000 hectare target. We also have things coming online that some people may have heard about in terms of peatland code projects. So peatland carbon code, uh, carbon credits, sorry. Uh, so undertaking restoration projects to then be able to sell on carbon credits afterwards as well, which would then introduce other elements of funding. So that is something that's being investigated. Um, the Peatland Code are trying to, to work with uh, not just Scotland, but also crofting communities as well to see how their scheme would actually run uh, where we are. So um, that's a whistle stop tour. <laughs> Here is uh, Donald's email address and my email address. If you have any questions or anything as well, we've got time now at the end of this session to, to try and answer as many as we can or defer to <laughs> people who know more. Um, but yeah, I'll pass back to Kathleen just now. That's excellent. Thanks both for very interesting um, presentations and lots of food for thought, I think, for everyone on the call. Um, there's so it's such a wide area when you talk about crofting and peatland and they're both very emotive subjects and, and ones that are close to our hearts as communities throughout the island so I think uh, there'll be plenty questions from from people I'm seeing uh, Donald has raised his hand so if you can come in Donald just unmute yourself and okay um thanks thanks Kathleen 
Um, the the I should I should uh, confess first of all I'm a, I'm a, an enthusiastic peat cutter. I'm over in Sky. I'm 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 not in. Uh, I was in Lewis, but been over in Sky for um, thirteen years and um, continuing the continuing the habit, uh, which is something I just can't give up. But um, you you you. It's really a question for Ben. Um, I know it was around Loch Arrissey there, there was some um, you'd uh, uh, reprofiled what appeared to be active peat banks. And uh, I, I wonder how um, the, 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 the users of the peat banks um, kind of reacted to that and what kind of negotiation there was. Um, and and, um, and what, what is their alternative? Um, because um, very conscious of the fact that uh, the, the the two the two worst uh, areas in Scotland for fuel poverty are the Western Isles and Shetland, uh, which of course is where most of the peat is cut for for domestic use. So um, you know, uh, what are your thoughts and what uh, uh, are us some enthusiastic peat cutters going to have to just give up the habit? Uh, thanks, Aldo. It's, it's a very good question. Uh, my, my, uh, peatland Action is not looking to stop peat cutting. Peatland Action is looking to restore degraded peatland uh, across Scotland. Uh, your food poverty comment is is absolutely spot on. Um, I also sit on the climate change working group uh, for the Outer Hebrides. Uh, no, sorry, for, uh, yeah, for the Outer Hebrides. And um, that comes up quite often in our discussions in terms of fuel poverty as well. Uh, and so in terms of peat cutting, the bank that I showed at Loch Horace, actually that particular bank was only half active. Uh, and it was further up. It was about a 250 metre long bank and they were only cutting a small segment. Um, part of my role, or I seem part of my role, is facilitating discussions between all the stakeholders on the land. So landowners, land managers, which includes common grazings, which includes individual crofters um, or people who aren't represented on these as well to try and make sure that everyone's on board for a project to go ahead. It just so happens the project we ran in Arnold initially was actually a 30 hectare site and the reason it dropped down to 28 hectares was because there was a group of peat cutters, uh, I think there was three or four, Donald can correct me if I'm wrong, there was three or four peat cutters uh, and say there was four, three of them were happy to either stop cutting peat or to move to another area within the, the common grazing banks, uh, but one gentleman didn't want to give up his bank. Uh, it was his uh, father's or his grandfather's bank, so he wanted to keep on cutting it uh, because of the connection to it, which is absolutely fine. We were able to then put mitigation in around the area that he was going to continue cut to keep cutting, uh, and we were able to to put things in there. So that's an example, and I will I'll use that more and more uh, as time goes on as well, so people may get sick of me saying it, but uh, as working with everyone who's involved in the area to make sure that everyone's happy with the restoration that's going on. My project, and I'm not here to stop peat cutting, I would encourage people to do, uh, to be as conscientious as possible with their peat cutting. Uh, machine cutting is very hit or miss. Traditional hand cut peat, hand cut peat done correctly, uh, taking care of the top turf, replacing it over the previous year's cut, etc, etc. Not digging drains, but you know, if you need to move water, move it considerately. Um, that's sort of an idea. Um, peat cutting, I yeah, it is. It's a it's a way of our it's a way of life here. I, I grew up in Sutherland. There was people who cut peat as well where I grew up as well. It's a way of our life. Uh, it's not something that's going to disappear overnight. But that we need to really think about how how we do it. I think is is, is what we need to consider. So hopefully that puts your mind at ease a wee bit, Donald. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, that's a very fair answer. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, both. Uh, I'm seeing Patrick has his hand up too. Hi there, um, thanks Don and Ben um, for uh, very interesting uh, presentations there and um, I, I think it's it's really good to see the the, the strong um, kind of climate conscience within the, the crofting areas and um, giving given more of a voice um, I think it's really important and um, like you've, you've both said um, the crofting areas and the crofters have, have got a strong role to, to play here in um, in, well, in food production, really going forwards in, a, in an ecological way. Um, 
I, I don't want to dwell on the peat cutting subject, but before Donald even um, asked his question, I was going to ask a, a similar question. And um, I think Don McKinnon maybe knew I was I was running some peat cutting events in, in Uist in the past year, and we'd been um, having a number of discussions about it. And like you mentioned there, Ben, about the re-wetting of the, the bottom of the peat bank when you put the turfs back, having cut it. Um, I should also disclose that I'm a very enthusiastic peat cutter but by hand um i'm i'm not fussed about the machine um but by hand i'm very enthusiastic and i wondered if there was if there was assessment and a uh, kind of uh, research being done on kind of in in the vein of balance between the the re-wetting benefits to an area when the hand cutting is done in in that proper way and if there's kind of evidence there um, or should there be more research in that area um, to add to the discussion and to give a kind of greater balance um, on that side of things in order that um, in the future if more uh, peatland restoration is done that there are still pockets here and there of available to cut land that we don't lose i guess for the future generations I'll maybe jump in first if then Donald wants to come in on anything. Um, there's definitely research going on in terms of looking at our degraded peatlands, but they're maybe not focusing on the peat cutting aspects. Uh, so it's definitely an area that, that could be looked into, uh, as, as, as the other Donald said as well about our fewer poverty areas that, that we, we're going through. You know, peat is a resource that's on our doorstep. It can be burnt, uh, you know, four or five days work and you've got your fuel for a year. Whereas is it worthwhile uh, getting oil that's extracted elsewhere, distilled and then shipped over and burnt and all this sort of thing. You know, it's it's an equation that needs greater minds than mine to work out the benefit, the, the numbers and the benefits from. Certainly, um, it, it's at the moment it seems to be a matter of conscience. What what do you feel better doing? Um, in terms of in terms of a common grazing, they usually a common grazing will have their peak cutting areas, their banks that they will allocate to people. They can give to new new visit uh, new village members, etc. I don't think it would be wise for a, a, a restoration project to look to restore areas, all the areas that contain peat banks, because as you say, if someone, someone comes in and says, I would like to start cutting, they have nowhere to go and you're potentially damaging an area that hasn't been touched before. Um, the closest thing that I can liken peat banks to, machine or hand cut banks, is if you imagine you've got your, uh, you're, you're doing a day of admin, and you're picking up rafts of paper and your hands come home with multiple paper cuts. That's the same sort of thing for the peatland. So a peat bank in its in a, a single peat bank in and of on itself is an inconvenience, it's annoying. But when you have multiple peat, peat banks in close concentration in an area, especially if they haven't been done with consideration, it can be very damaging to the to the the, the landscape and things. So there's definitely, definitely scope to do research to see exactly what's going on within a peat bank area or a peat cut area. There have been uh, studies and things done in Ireland, board pneumonia have been quite active in trying to previously make their case for peat extraction and things, but that's on vast scales compared to our individuals cutting for, for households and things. So um, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely scope for that um, to be looked into. And I, I would welcome that as well, because it touches on everything that, that uh, the other Donald mentioned as well in terms of fuel poverty. It's 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 a massive thing up here. Um, how, how do we how do we balance the books, as it were? OK, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing Gemma has got her hand up and then there's also a question from Kelly in the chat. So if we go to Gemma first. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, it's actually probably just carrying on from what you were saying there, Ben. Um, but it's, so yeah, I guess um, when you mentioned, you know, the cutting of the peat to create an affordable fuel source in an area that is suffering with fuel poverty and weighing the pros and cons of that against over importing like oil and things, who who is responsible for, for, for researching that and researching the implications of that? Um, I suppose that's my first question. My second question is, are you guys involved? Um, you know, Donald, you were saying um, that through, through the Scottish Crofting Federation, you're kind of there sort of in the background, like with policymakers, like making sure that the, the, 
that the crofters in the Highlands and Islands are being represented when this policy is being um, is being laid out. So, you know, how much of uh, a pool are you guys going to have on that? And also, there is a history of legislation being made in urban cities that don't actually take into consideration a rural landscape and the way in which people live in a rural community. And we've seen already that in England, they've just banned completely the cutting of peat. Um, so I suppose that is a real worry for people up here that they are just going to just a blanket, no more peat cutting. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's kind of where my question's coming from, that, that worry that uh, a government that's hundreds of miles away is going to make a decision for an island community. Well, I kick off on this one, Ben. Save, save you say the same thing again. <laughs> I, I, I think I think it's fair to say that I don't think there's any chance of peat cutting being banned in the near future. I don't think it's on the agenda. I think peat cutting is, is in decline. Uh, it certainly is in, in my area. Um, its impact is pretty low. Um, there may be some areas where it is, you know, where it, there's quite intense cutting going on. Um, ben mentioned machine cutting. You know, I think that that may be something that gets looked at. I, I've I haven't heard anybody saying that, but uh, I don't think that traditional peat cutting is at risk of, of being stopped. I, I think it will it will probably continue to decline. Um, keeping some of it going for um, you know, so that, so that we don't lose that part of our heritage, I think is quite important. And I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, but I think when we talk about fuel poverty and the, the issues affecting, uh, the, the, the very stark issues affecting our island in respect to that, I think that's where um, a smarter energy policy comes in and, and some of the other things that have been discussed this week about um, improving our home energy solutions, looking at innovative ways of heating our homes as well um, and, and decarbonizing heat. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll say it, but I don't think, I don't think peat is a solution to fuel poverty in the Western Isles. You know, I, I don't think that's the direction we need to head in. Totally think it's important for the people who still cut it to be able to, to do it. But I don't think like a mass return to peat cutting is the, is the solution that we need. Um, it, it's, there, there's, there's better ways of doing it. Thanks, Donald. Um, I'll jump in as well because Jim had a bit of another question as well. <laughs> uh, so the bit about the research and things as well, absolutely, uh, Peatland Action uh, are, are involved in, in a number of different uh, research programmes and projects as well. So uh, UHI, uh, based up in Thurso, and James Hutton Institute as well are doing a lot of uh, studies at the moment, uh, and we're looking at doing things. Uh, it's just... Uh, Patrick asked about the, the specific peat cutting areas. There's no, from my knowledge, there's no specific things looking at the, the erosion uh, from peat cutting areas. If I share this, if I can share my screen just for one more moment as well. This is a photo taken on the top of a hill uh, at Ben Bragger uh, on the west side of Lewis. And we're up and over the top of the, the summit here, looking down, uh, to, I guess, down towards Harris and the, and the other hills and things. Um, but this is to give an example of some of the erosion that we're seeing uh, that's not man-caused. So it's not just peat banks that we're talking about here. We're talking about things where these systems are, are, are you know, there's there's no peat tracks nearby here. There's no peat banks, etc. There was a shielding that was crumbling somewhere towards the left here. So it had been maybe used for rough grazing at points and maybe other things had gone on as well. But this is a huge scale. This is over 10 hectares we're talking about here with this haggy and gullied system so the gentleman I was with some of the hags were taller than his shoulder and his stick was disappearing into the peat so there was a huge amount of peat beneath our feet and a huge amount of peat above our heads at some points as well so these are areas that are really admitting things as well so uh, we're, we're talking about that. Sorry it hadn't shared your screen but it just... Oh, <laughs> typical typical uh, well there's the hills uh, there's the guy I was with uh, and you can see the hags and the gullies sorry uh, coming through there so 
there's there's natural erosion and there's man enhanced erosion through the things like peat banks and other things as well drainage channels and uh, you know there was previous uh, management payments for putting in meters of drains and all these sorts of things in in places that as Donald said with the shelter belt you know we wouldn't probably get the go ahead today so um, there's a research going into degradation and going into things to try and work out facts and figures and hard numbers for 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 our peatlands to to help shape discussions going forward. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it there if that's right. <laughs> yeah, no, it is an interesting question because it's one that's come up um, through my work as well in the past is that question of locally sourced peat versus imported oil and electricity. And just getting it, it is, it would be interesting if there were any figures on that that um, you had, we'd be interested in that too. So anything that comes back from that, good to see it. Um, Kelly has put a question in the chat. Feel free to come in and uh, speak to the question yourself, Kelly, but I'll, I'll read it out. What is the ratio of amount of peat restored compared to amount of peat cut in any given year? Uh, that is a good question and I would like to know the answer. <laughs> um, from, from Peatland Action's point of view, we have restored since 2012 just somewhere between 25 to 26,000 hectares of peatland um, in terms of peat extracted by, by cutting. I wouldn't even know where to, to, to start with that. We would have to start speaking to all the common grazings, uh, not just in the islands, but across Scotland to try and figure that one out, I'm afraid. Um, a loose stat that I was pulling together the other day, in the Outer Hebrides, we have 300, just over 300,000 hectares worth of land and of that, over, I think it's 107,000 hectares are classifiable as peat or peat soils, so could be eligible for restoration. So um, we have a long way to go in terms of restoring peatland in, in the Outer Hebrides and, and things. And yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you're going to be kept busy for quite a while. Um, just to better keep going with questions, which is great to have uh, so many people asking. Ewan from Barra, I think you were next, if you can. Unmute, thank you. Oh, struggling here. There we go. It's just a, a general question, largely for Donald. I, <clears throat> we're interested, or we're progressing a proposal for a pilot seaweed farm down here in Barra, or actually in Battersea. And you mentioned methane inhibitors and feed supplements. And it sort of piqued my interest, we're wondering about circular economies, beach cast seaweed, um, and perhaps revisiting to what may have been in a traditional um, activity in the past and could local seaweed be used are there any studies i was thinking north ronaldsea and just throwing it open yeah so there is there is quite a bit of work going on uh, about whether seaweeds uh, could have a methane inhibiting effect and there's um a, a seaweed from uh, there, there's work, the work in Australia and New Zealand looking at um, aspergillopsis or something like that. I don't know how you say it, but um, uh, this specific like microalgae that, um, well, it's not micro, but it's like really small, um, that grows in these warm waters and it has a massive um, effect on methane, uh, like crazy numbers. I think it's 80% reductions in methane when, when it's in, introduced into feed. Um, so that doesn't grow naturally in Scotland, and I don't think you could cultivate it. Um, but there's certainly a lot of work going on about how how you can maybe use that, um, how, how it could potentially be grown in tanks, and and how it could be uh, commercialised in a way where it could actually be incorporated into feed in a in a practical way. Um, the I forget the active um, the the reason why that seaweed is. Um, relevant it's a specific chemical that's uh, that's that's in it um and it's it's in that particular species of seaweed it's found in this uh, really really high um concentration but it's it's in seaweeds in that are native to scotland it's just not in the same concentrations so there could still be a methane inhibiting effect but it might not be quite as uh high as with this specific species the other problem is that these seaweeds and uh, have really high concentrations of iodine, so um, that's that's a that's a problem uh, if you're in, in 
uh, incorporating them into feeds because too much iodine can cause all sorts of problems, um, particularly for cattle. So th there's a lot of work still to be done there, but it's really exciting stuff. And if there could be a way for um, if there could be a way for that to be done and uh, some cultivation to be done around that and, and create a, another industry for uh, uh, for the Outer Hebrides, that would be fantastic. And there is, it's Queen's University Belfast are doing a lot of work on this um, to, to look at the um, what, how the different seaweeds um, play a role. Um, Thank you very much. An open and and the, the point about North Royal say I, I don't I don't know to be honest. I think the, the, the way the way that you actually get these stats about measuring methane uh, concentrations, it, it it's it's quite um, I my understanding of it is anyway that it has to be done in quite an intensive uh, setting, you know, in um, in in chambers that that measure the 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 methane. Um, so I don't know how you would do it in that sort of extensive setting on on North Ronaldsay. Um, but maybe they could take that and replicate it in a lab environment and 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 try and measure it that way. But it would be interesting to find out, I think. Um, but not all seaweeds are equal. I think that's the point, uh, that it's not seaweed, it's specific types of seaweed. Right. No, it's just I was in the talk the other week and they were talking about the asparagopsis down in New Zealand. I think there's a European equivalent in the same family. So it's worthwhile checking out, but we'll watch the space. Thanks. OK. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce that either, I have to say. Um, it, leading on, Vanessa's um, got some questions. I don't know, Vanessa, if you're uh, happy to speak through this or whether I'll just read it out. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of happy to speak on it, mainly because I kind of use seaweed in artwork as well. But I just wondered, my second question was here, that if Obviously, I live in Benbecula, and so we've got a lot of maca here. And I mean, people are spreading seaweed on land. And obviously, you know, I'm just wondering whether if you're planting crops on that, does that feed into the crops? And would that actually mitigate if the animals are eating that? Um, whether that also would have some mitigation against methane? I don't know. I mean, there's a lovely PhD project here, I think, for someone to be able to sort of do something on this. But my second question as well was about Muir Burn and Patrick has sort of left in that, but this came up in the sort of Peatlands sort of um, uh, group work and stuff, which, which was done here recently, which he sort of mentioned. And no one's mentioned anything about Muir Burn and the effect of that on peat as well, because the evidence seemed to suggest that it doesn't certainly do anything in terms of ticks and stuff like that. So is it something that should be encouraged to be stopped. So that would be my question, really. Uh, I have absolutely no idea about the, the first point, um, but I think that it's, uh, on, on the point about macher cropping, I, I think that links back into the what I was saying about biodiversity and how, you know, we're talking about this from the, the climate angle, thinking about methane, but that practice has such value from a biodiversity aspect and it's totally linked to livestock production without the the cattle there would be no cropping on the macha uh, in, in that way anyway um so yeah that's that's all i would say on that i, I i'll let ben talk about your bird uh thank you <laughs> um yeah i i i i, I, I that's a good topic yeah, a hot topic indeed. Sorry, it's a, it's a poison chalice, is it not? <laughs> I, I, I sat in, I, I was late to the party uh, to, to see, the, I think it was um, the community association, uh, uh, begins with G, can't I remember, but they did a PE year. So their last talk was on Falishka, the muir burning, and I, I sat in on that to, 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 to hear a wee bit about it. Um, muir burning is... Uh, is a, is a contentious issue because some people think it is the, the best thing since sliced bread and other people believe it's not. Uh, and the, the two parties are very uh, reluctant to meet anywhere in the middle. There is the Muir Burning Code, which sets out practices that should be followed and, and, and various other things. Um, the, the, the issue I have with Muir Burning is a, a burn on peatland, whether man 
set or naturally occurring burns the vegetation but also has the, the potential for drying out and changing the chemistry of that top layer of peat so that ved that water table that i was talking about in my presentation uh, a burn even uh, i've heard people talking about cold burns and various other different techniques that they try to employ during uh, burning on the muir um it's going to change the chemistry of that top layer, which then changes the vegetation when it comes back. And there's short cycles and there's long cycles to the peatland vegetation. And both of those cycles seem to result after muir burning in more heather, which is what is trying to be burnt away in the first place. From my understanding, I'm not uh, a, a crofter, uh, so I don't, I have, I don't uh, have the background in it or the, the, the full understanding of it. But the, the heather comes back and is, it will be stronger and the, the, the vegetation that's left is more susceptible to heather dominating that landscape again. So it's actually, it needs to be done so often to stay on top of the heather that's being encouraged. It could be damaging to the, 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 to the, the peatland surface and then the peat underneath. Um, peat, if it is burnt um, in a healthy and active system even, can then, the character of it can be changed so that it's hydrophobic. So then it doesn't, uh, store the water or, or hold on to the water in the same way that it did previously, which can then enhance erosion as well. So there's a huge, for me, the only thing I can see happening with muir burn is negatives and negatives, but there are people who believe muir burn to be the only method of management that's available. So um, yeah, we, we need to work. There's definitely, we need to work together and try and work out what the, the middle ground is to try and help management in potential, these potential areas, but also try and protect the, the landscape and the habitat. There are, there are projects down in England. Um, if you are bored and you have Google Earth, if you look at uh, Kinder Scout, uh, there's a restoration project there uh, and they've been involved in uh, trying to do uh, to, to bring back vegetation to bare peat, um, but they're also involved in trials for heather cutting um, and heather baling for using in restoration and these sorts of things as well. So there's techniques which can potentially be employed up here, but they're, they're being sort of uh, run down in England. So we need to sort of translate them for our, for our Outer Hebrides context to make them make sense. But there are there there, there could be potentials, uh, potential alternatives even to, to mirror burning. Um, but yeah, I think that covers the question, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big question. Sorry, if I could just add something there. I, you talked about the code for, for Muir Burn, and I can't remember the details of it now, but it just seemed to me that when you looked at the code for Muir Burn, that actually most of viewers would sort of fit into, uh, you know, reasons for not burning, you know, if you actually looked at the code as such. But anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I, th I think there's a... a, a... A revision or a reworking of the code coming out as well so uh, as from from my knowledge there could be things in the in the pipeline that might help these conversations get developed because uh, it was raised before at the point you know about uh, governments setting things that sound good in an urban context but in reality do they translate on the ground and things and donald might you know have a, a, a view on that as well so um yeah there's there's definitely work that can be done um I think Ryan might have been coming in on that same topic because I, I have seen a comment in the chat. So the event you were talking about, Ben, was the Grimsey Community Association. Um, so Ryan, I don't know if you want, you have anything else to say? Yeah, sorry. Um, I was just figuring out how to get my camera on and, and uh, how to unmute myself, which is always fun. Uh, I just wanted to ask, Benjamin, um, whether in your experience um, in, in this kind of work and research you've done yourself or, or others have done, um, are there ways of um, grazing cattle, whether that's sheep or cows on more settings? Because a lot of common grazings have, have got some peatland in them, uh, especially in the Hebrides. And so, you know, it, are there ways of, of making that kind of work or is it kind of predominantly just the fact that, you know, you've got loads of trotters kind of going back and forth over the peat and that kind of digs it up and aerates it and presumably kind of disturbs um, the top layer or is it kind of an intensity question or, or what's kind of what, what's the deal there? I think you've, you've, you've answered your own question in the last part there. It, it's more the, the intensity and the level of grazing that I would say is, is could be the issue. Um, 
Donald's probably better to come in on this from his crofting uh, background and he might have some direction. As far as research and things are going, there, there have been studies looking at grazing and things. That, uh, the, the, the resource that jumps to mind is the, the Fen Management Handbook. So it's completely not appropriate for us in the Outer Hebrides, but uh, they talk about grazing pressures and managing that um, on, on fens, which are effectively peatlands uh, to an extent. Um, and then that translate as well into sort of the metrics we look at. For 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 me in the Outer Hebrides, anecdotally, crofting is is on the decline. Livestock numbers are are, are on the the, draw, the down as well. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, that they couldn't still do damage and things. Our great unknown, I believe, is the deer as well. What the deer are doing across the, the open moor as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that could be looked into it, the the intensity is is the thing and the grazing damage the trampling damage that's that 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 that's the issue I, i've been on i was actually doing a survey um was it last week a couple, uh, recently i was doing a survey anyway i was walking across the land and it looked from the way the sun was of a perfectly untouched blanket bog um and i'd sort of went round a wee bit further and then suddenly I could see tracks, these meandering tracks cutting across through the, the, the vegetation and things. So obviously animals, whatever they were, had been walking through here, but they had been walking through in such a, a low density that it hadn't broken the surface or done anything that would be um, detrimental. So um, yeah, there are areas I have seen where uh, on some common grazings where uh, livestock have been Con uh, concentrated and maybe not released as, as much as you, you could, they could have been and that has damaged the vegetation layer and then that will start it's, it's almost like a domino effect once that vegetation layer is broken through and there's bare peat being exposed and the water's not behaving in the way it should be the dominoes knock on and then the erosion can spread and things so um yeah i, I don't i don't feel that answers your question but um, donald might be able to chip in a bit more um from his background as well well, just just to say that you know that, that there's absolutely a role for for livestock to continue grazing on on peatlands and uh, and as as Ben said, you know a, a healthy and active peatland can actually be better um, for for grazing livestock than a, a degraded one um, that's covered in hags and bare peat, um, and and the livestock can can actually be a part of maintaining that landscape as well. Um, ben mentioned heather there, and that um, an abundance of heather kind of <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but it kind of like shows that there's a problem, but it can also uh, has to be addressed to to cause to um, to sort out the peatland as well, and and livestock keeping that heather in check is is part of it. Um, it can be part of that process. But the other thing, and I think you touched on this in your question, Ryan, is that. Um, a common grazing and, and an unfa and particularly unfenced common grazings um, aren't just peatland, you know, they're a mosaic of habitats and, and different areas. So I, I know that when I put my sheep out onto the moor, they don't spend an awful lot of time actually grazing on the peatland itself. They're usually following rivers and grazing and grazing along um, these grassy areas. Um, and, and in those areas, they're actually doing a really important job in removing that vegetation, like I spoke about earlier and making sure that there is habitat, open open habitat for, for waders to nest um, and, and other species. So livestock have a really important role to continue playing in that in that environment, but we just have to monitor it and, and keep, a, keep an eye on the impact that they're having. And the difference between livestock and deer is that when we see that the livestock are causing a problem, we can change our management of them and we can, we can move them off and uh, graze them somewhere else. With the deer, that's that's a lot more difficult, and it's a lot more difficult to know exactly how many deer are in an area um, compared to uh, how many sheep or how many cattle are off to those grazing. So, if I could add one thing to uh, what I said myself, and also in general to the discussion, there's a uh, there's a person I don't know if she's a student or not, but there's a person that's just been doing research with Stirling University. And what she's been doing, I think she's a soil microbiologist, whether that's in training or already is one. Um, but she's been looking, taking soil samples uh, throughout Scotland, I think mostly in the northwest, though, from former sheeling sites and looking at um, the soil quality there. And, you know, basically um, soil health and quality in former sheeling sites is significantly higher better 
than in the surrounding land around it. Obviously, um, that's just in terms of, you know, how much life there is. And I, I would say that because of the kind of localized grazing that was happening in sheathings, we can't really, they're not, they're generally not peatlands anymore because you'll, you'll see them stand out. They're the green patch mm. on the, on the moorland. So anyways, um, I guess that also ties in with what you were saying, Donald, in terms of, you know, that's, that's precisely the kind of place that you'll find the sheep going to because that's where the grass is, right? Even in the winter months. So um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty complicated picture, but thanks. Thanks a lot to both of you for, for, uh, for, pitching in on that. Thanks, Ryan. And I think you, you summarized it well. It is a, a complex picture and one that, like Donald has said, it's it's good. It's a there's an opportunity for peatlands and crofting to work well together and be managed well. And that's where hopefully communities can come in as well on that and common grazing groups. Um full note in the chat, I think the question is been discussed to a degree, but I'll read it out in case there's anything else to add. So he's saying, given how expensive the restoration is, and this is uh, to Ben, is there anything else we can do in the short and medium term to restore degraded peatlands? Would reducing livestock stocking densities and reducing deer numbers make a difference? Oh, good question. Uh, restoration. Uh, can be expensive. It depends on the area that needs to be restored. Um, I, probably, I don't actually think I mentioned that. Peatland Action, sorry, will offer funding to cover the restoration costs, so that all the capital costs associated with restoration, that's what my, my project aims to, to deliver. So uh, we are accepting applications from potential uh, restoration sites. Basically, if, if you're, you're thinking about a restoration site, get in touch with myself, or if you're not on the Outer Hebrides, you can get in touch with Peatland Action in general, and you'll be pointed to your, your local Peatland Action officer, and, and you can liaise with them to, to discuss about that sort of thing. In terms of other things that we can be doing, yes, if you're noticing in an area that the grazing is having a detrimental impact on, on, on the, the peatland, then that's something that can be looked at. I know there's the agri-environment and climate scheme that's just been extended until 2024. Um, I was hoping there's that there's a scheme that's uh, P POBAS pilot of outcome based. Uh, I can never remember the acronym. Uh, AS. Uh, it's 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 again. There's information on it on the Nature Scott website. They, they were that's a, a system that's looking to reward uh, land managers for the condition their land is in. And if people have peatlands that are degraded um, and they are looking to restore them or to better manage them to promote restoration or uh, uh, that sort of thing, then the payments increase basically is what that, that outcome based scheme would look to, to reward. So that I was hoping if that came in quicker, then that would be a really useful thing for us here and not just in the Outer Hebrides, but in the crofting context as well for, for people looking to, to, to get management payments and things. In terms of looking at our peatlands, um, in the, in, the, in the short term, it's really a case of identifying where those areas are is probably the best thing that we can do, uh, even though restoration can be expensive. A lot of conversations I have with people is like, our, our peatlands are fine. You know, you, you drive from, from uh, Barvis to Stornoway and you go through the Lewis Peatland SPA, people are like, it's fine, you know, there's no erosion or anything. But when you're actually walking across it, you can stop and see the cracks and the fissures that are starting to form on that peatland. So it may not be... Um, like the picture I showed at the top of Ben Bragger, where it's evidently eroding, there could be small erosion that's taking place as well. So there's things that we can do early on to have a look and see, um, to see what's being, what's what's maybe triggering the erosion and things. So yeah, that feels like a bit of a, an unhelpful answer. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Phil, <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I am now seeing the. Well, first of all, to say to Donald Murdy, I have seen your comment about um, carbon credits and carbon trading, but I think we'll leave that for a minute and just go to um, Alistair Nicholson, who's saying, Norwegians gave up peat cutting for domestic fuel over 100 years ago. Has there been any comparative studies on health of peatland? And would there be lessons for us? Uh, not to my knowledge, but that doesn't mean it's not been done. <laughs> um, 
if if that if that's true that they gave up uh, over a hundred years ago, then they should definitely be seeing some uh, impact from from that reduction uh, or, or stopping in peat cutting. Um, it goes back to what I said before about if you imagine your hand and you've been doing a day of admin and suddenly you've got all these paper cuts, then that's kind of you may not see. Uh, it may not always be visible, but there there, there could be those small healings that are are, are happening. Um, one of the issues I, I didn't actually point it out in the photos when I was going through the, the case study, um, the, the eroding peat banks, if they've not been cut for a while, the, the, the face can be undermined by wind and, and, and rain erosion uh, so that the top of the peat bank starts to curve over the top. And then that vegetation that's left on top becomes so heavy, it pulls the face of the peat bank down and creates a brand new fissure, effectively a brand new peat face a couple of centimetres, 10, 15 centimetres back or so. And then the whole erosion process starts again with that new face starting to erode and it can then move across. So an unmanaged or uncut peat bank can erode across a peatland system. And, and, and that's what we're talking about in terms of if there's a high concentration of now abandoned peat banks, it can do uh, quite a significant amount of damage over time. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm very aware though, I don't want to hark on about peat banks. My, my project's not here to, to stop peat cutting or to, to tell people what to do. But it, if, if there's areas where there's not active peat cutting going on and it doesn't look like that will be resumed, then they could be eligible for restoration to stop that um, fissuring and cracking. Definitely in terms of, I think the second point was, would there be lessons for us um, to see how people adapted to not cutting fuel, uh, peat fuel for fuel? Sorry, I put my teeth in. Not cutting peat for fuel, how they were then able to to do heating and things like this as well. That might be a good, um, a good sort of comparison that may may translate to us. I don't know. Uh, I I don't know enough about it. I'm afraid to say for sure. Yeah, it does sound like there's a lot of studies out there, and like was mentioned before, uh, there is a decrease in peat cutting. So I think there's there's I'd imagine plenty of areas that could be restored to begin with without going near anywhere that's actively being cut. So in terms of funding, you mentioned there was funding for uh, areas. Is that 100% funding or do communities have to raise their own finance for a certain amount? No, no. Uh, through Peatland Action, we would cover the entire capital costs associated with the restoration. So Donald can vouch for this uh, being uh, his connections with Arnold. Um, my role, as I said, works working with all the stakeholders. So I was working with the Common Grazings and uh, Barvis Estate Trust to, to, to draw up the, the, the restoration plan, but then also the application for the funding. Um, but the funding was all uh, was, was granted for the entire restoration project and that's how peatland action operates it's it, we're not uh, offering management payments or things into the future but we will cover the all the costs associated with a restoration project so contractors laborers machines um materials as well some of the materials we use uh, we try as much as possible to use peat and vegetation that's on site because it's growing on site so therefore it should be okay um but there are times when the degradation is too much that we need to bring in extra materials, whether that's sphagnum plugs with a mixture of sphagnum to help cover the bare areas or stone for stone dams or timber for timber dams and things to slow the flow of water across systems. So again, all of the materials would be included within a peatland action application. So the costs would be covered and um, there shouldn't be a cost for uh, a community to, to, to do that. That's great. No, I think there would be definite interest um, and hopefully after this session, you might get a few people <laughs> getting in touch. Um, to go back then to Donald Murdy's point about carbon credits. Now, this was my, in the first session of this week. Uh, it was really the, the community energy session that we had, but it did um, somehow get round to carbon credits and peat. So it's been, it's a hot topic, another another topic that um, is, sounds quite contentious, but I don't know, Donald, if you wanted to kind of talk to your point a wee bit. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Kathleen. Um, it, it, I don't really understand it, and I don't think very many people do. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the, there was an article in the last, in the last Crofter which was about as clear as mud about, uh, about carbon credits and carbon trading. And in fact, um, if you see the next um, crofter, I've, 
I've actually written an article in response to that in which I'm a bit scathing and maybe a bit unfairly so. But, but um, you know, do you, is, is there anything, you could, any way you can enlighten us? Personally, I think it's something that crofters shouldn't be touching with a barge pole or a, or a tarishker because um, it, 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 sound, it sounds like something for the green layers and not something for us, especially as if you create these carbon credits um, on, say, on your common grazing, um, they belong to the landlord. The, the, and, and the landlord can trade them and, you know, and make money out of them unless, unless it's agreed that the, that the crofters can own the, the, the credits that they've created. To me, it, it, it sounds like a, a scam. And, uh, and, and and a very unsavoury one, especially when combined with a sort of, you know, the the the, the green layered phenomenon that's that's creeping across the highlands. You may be a lot better off, of course, in the Western Isles, where you're predominantly under community ownership. So so it may not be it may be it may be a clearer issue, and it may be a lot more beneficial. But I just want to wonder if 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 you'd like to if you'd like to comment on that at all. Can I say a few things on this, Ben? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I think this is the one of the biggest issues at the moment that we need to get our heads around as quickly as possible. And a lot of people will tell you that they've they it's fine. We know we understand it all. You know, we've got um, it, it's it's very clear who owns these carbon credits. It, it's not. It's it's it, it hasn't been tested. Um, that article in the Crofter, for example, uh, that you're referring to, Donald, it, it did say that the landlord owned the carbon credits. And that's what Peatland Code will tell you, that the landlord owns the carbon credits. Um, there's no word of whether a, a landlord would have to seek the consent of uh, the Crofters on a common grazings before going ahead with the scheme. Uh, I, I think that would almost certainly have to be the case. And, and why peatland code um and and i should make the point that this is completely separate to ben's organization peatland action and um, why peatland code are saying that without getting proper um proper legal advice on the on the crofting side of things i i, I it's lost on me i don't understand it but I, th I think like any uh like any development that would take place in our common grazings while this is very very different to um renewable schemes or even tree planting, um, I, I would think that if that if that did take place, then the crofter, the shareholder, should be entitled to fifty percent of the value. Um, now that's assuming that it, that this is something that's that's. I, I think I think we've got to accept that this is happening. Um, personally, I think it's uh, it's not the right way to go. You know, I think we've got. Um, ben talked about the figures that there's a huge. Um, amount of money needing to be spent to restore Scotland's peatlands, and um, it just seems to be ha seems to have been accepted that that money can't possibly come from the public purse, um, and that's a very political statement for um, uh, quite often. I hear civil servants saying it um, to be making, um, because it's it's unimaginative to think that we need to just create a market to fund this. It is my is my view, um, and and the actual. <laughs> at, at the at the end of the day, this this isn't about people making money. This is about uh, which is what a market would creating a market in carbon credits would would do. Um, this is a, this is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And instead of companies buying carbon credits to restore um, restore peatlands in the in the Outer Hebrides, these companies need to be reducing their 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 own carbon footprints. You know, off, offsetting. Is, is offsetting really what we need to happen now? We need both to happen. We need those companies to reduce their carbon emissions and we need the peatland to be restored. Um, but I, as you can tell, I like ranting about this one and I usually spend quite a lot of my time ranting to Ben about it. So I don't know if you want to come in to say anything, Ben. Uh, yeah, it, it makes for good coffee breaks, I'll tell you that, with uh, the video generation of, of meetings nowadays. Uh, me and Donald and our boss, Sally, as well, talk about this at length. Um, the peatland code was established, I think it was in 2013 it was established, so it's still relatively new, um, but it's tried to base itself off the woodland code, you know, plant three trees, you'll save this amount of carbon, here's your money for, for those carbon credits, etc. Peatlands 
yes, could work in that same sort of way, but you don't plant three peatlands, you, you've got peatland. Um, and it's a very, very difficult issue in terms of land ownership and everything. As Donald touched upon, if you ask the peatland code and you go through those materials, the carbon credits belong to the landowner and that's as far as they're concerned. So then if the landowner decides they want to share the credits and the, the, the income, then fair enough. The, the, the code itself works off a, 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 a sort of, not reward, but it pays for the emissions that you are saving by doing the restoration. So if you have a heavily or actively eroding system, heavily degraded system, it could be releasing up to 24 metric tonnes of, of carbon dioxide uh, a year. Um, so that if you restore that, in theory, it will jump up a condition category and then its emissions will be less. So you'll be rewarded for that lack of emissions uh, that, that, that the site is able to achieve and, and, and store within that ground going forward. The peatland code and the carbon credits side of things have a slightly different viewpoint to what we do within, or I believe we do within peatland action. We're looking at restoring a landscape and then promoting it to be healthy and active going forward. As I talked about that pathway of restoration to, to go into the future, the peatland code look at doing the restoration, to stop the emissions, and that's kind of where they they draw the line. They're they're not looking at beyond that, and that's not a criticism. It's just that's the way that's set up because they are doing the, the carbon trading um, aspect of things. I think it's. Uh, it's a, it's an incredibly difficult topic because, uh, as Donald touched on, it leads to you know should these companies be uh, should these companies be changing their behaviour or should they be relying on us restoring our peatlands that are on our doorstep? It, it's you know it's it's what's the the climate justice and all these sorts of things as well the terminology that's being spoken about at the moment it's a, it's an incredibly difficult thing uh, to 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 come to terms with and to really make sense of. Uh, at the end of the day. If it's a scheme that's looking to promote restoration of peatland, I can't really have an argument with that. But it's then what what, the, what are the outputs from that system that could be the or, or are the, the, the difficulties and the, and the problem things. Um, so I'll keep myself to peatland action and, and doing restoration and, and we'll fund the restoration for you. So we'll, 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 how about that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think uh, it's, there's a lot of moral sort of or ethical questions around it. And, you know, to have someone like BP come and pay while still burning all their oil and, you know, you do, it, it, it's difficult, but it's also difficult when it's a community landowner mm. as well. So there's all these sort of conflicting, which is the same with any sort of big development um, questions, but yeah, lots of sort of moral dilemmas for communities. There's also something I should have chipped in and said as well. The, the carbon that we have in our peatlands as well, if we are moving into a world where we need to be accountable for our own emissions as well, there's a danger of selling them on to someone else to then have to buy them from someone else again. Um, and that's way down the line and you're talking about, you know, massive amounts of carbon credits having to be traded and everything but there is that potential of if we have to be accountable for our own actions you know if i drive my car from where i stay to stornoway do i have to then have to do something to mitigate for the emissions from my car and various other things you know that's it's a world that i don't think is too far away but we you know we're, we need to get ready for it you can rest easy in that situation then you can say you've re restored so many areas of peat. You you can <laughs> do. It I've got well. three hundred and sixty-one round trips from Rodal to the butt. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the questions uh, whether that's the best way to do it as well. Um, well, thanks, Tom, for opening up that discussion. I don't know if Gemma I, is your hand up linked to that question. Uh, please feel free to come in. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I I probably should have put that down. Um, because I. I, I, it was it was an ignorant question because I wasn't understanding the conversation um, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a crofter, I'm not a landowner, so I, I'm, I'm, I know that on the Solval estate that there is plans for, or certainly um, the, the estate owner is planning to meet with the community at some point, hopefully in the near future, to discuss two more possible sites of peat restoration and also a couple of wind farms as well. Um, and he's he's said we we uh, there was an uh, Niall uh, Niall Houston did an interview with him whereby the estate owner said that he would give fifty percent of um, I assume it's the carbon credits but he was going to give fifty percent of it to the communities on which these wind farms and peat restorations would be taking place and then the other fifty percent was going to charities 
So I thought that sounded great, but again, I'm very ignorant. I, I think from little bits of the conversation there, are, are we saying that's not good or or there's an ethical issue there? Like, yeah, sorry. Um, it might be, a, like, please don't feel, I'm conscious of the time, so please don't feel like we have to go into it because it is me just being ignorant. I'll jump in quickly and say it's it's not an ignorant question at all. I I, I have been in discussions with people associated with Oval State as well, talking about the, the restoration that they're hoping to do because Loch Orrissey were hoping to do a third phase of restoration there as well. So that might tie into their thinking about their, their endeavours into the Peatland Code and things as well. Um, it, it's not. I, it, it, Donald was talking and uh, about the, the green layers and things as well. It's the potential for the potential for the system to be misused, uh, let's put it that way. Um, but if the, the landowner is committing to giving money to the common grazings and the rest of charity, then it doesn't suggest that that, that, that uh, sentiment is there uh, at all, which would be admirable. I think um, there's a potential for the system to be used the other way around uh, and there not to be the benefit to the community and things. So carbon credits uh, and carbon code it's not something that I would say people shouldn't investigate. Absolutely have a look at it and see the, P the IUCN Peatland Code website will contain a lot of the information you need to get conversations going and thought processes going and things. Um, I'm just not I'm not an authority on it because my roles within Peatland Action and, and looking at doing restoration projects within Peatland Action. But the Peatland Code is 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 something that's an opportunity for people if if if, if, if it's applicable. So. Uh, have, a, have a look in that and make sure that you're um, what's the best way of saying it make sure you're up to speed with it yourselves rather than just taking people's word for it that you um, are, are fully versed in what's of what the, the opportunities and also the potential uh, not issues but the other potential uh, things that may have to be considered uh, to, to fall into the peatland code sorry Donald I was just going to say very quickly there that um, you know I, I'm not at all saying that that, uh, that example is, is, is a bad one but it's um, my point is that we shouldn't have to rely on a landlord to decide to do the right thing with this um, and and to be altruistic and give that away. Um, it 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 has to be a, an integral part of the process for um, for the carbon credit process going forward. That 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 there are legal mechanisms in place for um, both the crofters being rewarded. Uh, adequately or, or being compensated adequately I should say and, and also community benefit as well so um, my, my point is more that it's uh, at the moment it's at the at the whim of uh, well the discussion anyway it seems to be it's at the whim of the landlord what they do with it rather than um, uh, any sort of um, mechanism in place. So is that something then that, so, and I have to apologise, I'm actually on the ferry um, where they're permitting tomorrow morning, so I am going to miss the session tomorrow, which um, I'm really sad about because this week's been brilliant. Um, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank um, yourself, Kathleen, and obviously Matthew as well for like organising it, and a big thanks to all our speakers. Um, but is that something then, Donald, that you would say needs to go forward tomorrow to the policymakers, to the, the MSP and the MP? Um, is, is that something that the the government can can step in on that if you know if these green layers are getting these carbon credits and they're not saying we're going to give it to the community and they're wanting to keep it for themselves that it is is used for a green purpose and and not as you say going to other sort of industry or whatever that are perhaps not as green Yeah, I think it's definitely something that we should be making our representatives aware of, and it's a conversation that needs to continue, and um, we all need to be engaged in it, um, and yeah, try and find a way forward. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Jim, and something, yeah, I've been trying to gather points through the week of things that we can raise. I'm, I'm hoping that um, communities and individuals themselves will raise it, but anything that hasn't been raised tomorrow, I'll then follow up at the end with, with any points. And I think uh, the carbon credits one, from the discussions we've had just even this week, uh, I'm not very up on, on carbon credits and peat credits, um, but it's definitely been on the agenda this week and something that we'll have to look into in more detail. Good to see because it's a, it sounds like something that community groups are going to be up against more and more. And I think one of the, the key things that 
groups or areas should be looking at is who's buying if if it comes to it, who is buying these carbon credits and what what are they doing and in terms of their um sustainability and whether you know that's something that the communities are wanting to support through that carbon credit system so that's just an, another point to make on that um i think kenny was next with his hand up in this way without the actual i don't know what it's called emoji thing thank you i haven't qualified to working out this yellow hand yet <laughs> but uh, just just uh, a very interesting discussion with regards to the carbon credits uh just a point of clarification really is is it only restored peatland that would qualify for carbon credit Yes, it needs. There's a, a. The short answer is yes. The, the longer answer is yes. The, the peatland code need. Uh, they have a, a process that a, a site must go through. Uh, it needs to be registered on the peatland code, and it needs to be validated by an external uh, surveyor to to make sure that a the, the peatland is in the con the original condition you say it is in, and then b to say that once you've restored it, the condition that it's in. Um, because it's working off the emissions uh, of the greenhouse gases and then uh, the carbon credits relate to the, the, the drop in emissions and things. Uh, so yes, it, it would have to be on a restored peatland, uh, but it has to go through uh, their, their processes first to be eligible and things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm noticing on that theme, um, Alistair has put in the chat, why don't we invent a community green, green credit? Um, carbon credits are inventions, change the rules. Alistair, are you wanting to come in and speak to that a bit? Well, I, I just think that uh, the whole carbon credits um, are a, an invention of re relative um, recent invention and if we are uh, so they're made up so it, it seems to me that if we're wanting to look at something where there is a much more community orientated um, system that involves the community there would be a case for saying a uh, right, let's just change the rules and and have something that is different that can uh, that can you know, have a better connection with people, place, and community. And um, you know, let's not be inhibited by the rules as other agencies make. We have our own degree of agency. Um, you know, do something about it. You know, I think uh, if there's anything we've learned over the years in the Western House is how strong and determined community groups are. And I think if, if there's anything that um, can be done, community groups can do it. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good point and one that will need quite a bit of discussion. And I think maybe a follow-up session uh, would be good to go through, you know, carbon and peat and community credits in general i think so <laughs> <Yeah. could> be. <laughs> we're kind of conscious it's 24 now but um yeah thanks also i think that's a, a very worthwhile point does anyone have any other um points or questions they'd like to put just before we wrap up the session ewan See if I can get, yep, I've got them all. Just a very quick one, um, and it's a, a more general one, um, because we talked about um, what the definition of peatland was, but there's obviously different habitat types when you, you start looking at a landscape, and whether there's a case for, um, and we, we've got different, we've got the um, woodland credit scheme, we've got two different schemes for peatland, we've got grazing interests, I, would an approach that looked at zoning and mapping be useful? 
so that we, we could identify what the best approach would be within either a spatial sort of landscape level? Potentially, yeah. Um, I've, um, I've actually been out and about with a, a landowner looking at an area of potential peatland restoration, and we had a discussion that maybe the area wasn't suitable for peatland restoration because it would be more appropriate for riparian, uh, it's on the edge of a riverbank, etc. Um, and trying to, to, to plot out where the areas of peatland might be within that, that landscape that could uh, be benefited, uh, could benefit from restoration and things versus things like how could they then enhance the riparian areas for, for the habitat there. Um, in terms of zoning across, there's multiple things that are available and are out there. Thinking um, off off the top of my head, in terms of um, the uh, the categorizations of, of of the landscape, I, it's now completely left my my mind. But the, the code for peatlands M seventeen, eighteen, and nineteen come to mind. Uh, if someone can translate that, I find out if that'd be helpful. Um, there's also things like the carbon soils map as well uh, for Scotland that tries to map where where effectively the, the, the concentrations of peat are within the Scottish soils. Um, there are there are tools that are out there already, but there's definitely room for improvement. A lot of people would argue the carbon soils map doesn't match up correctly or the the, the other categories I was talking about don't match up, uh, up not appropriately, but accurately enough um, to make these sort of decisions from, from desktop and, and having to rely on, on field visits and, and extra effort and things to go to things. So um, yeah, is the short answer. <laughs> No, no, thanks. It's just to tie it in to try and get everyone goes in and it's sort of this narrowness that it's peatland or all else, but really you should be looking at the whole system. You, you could get improvements in stock condition from shelter belts. And I'm just thinking of utilising the whole landscape rather than just individual features. Hmm. Well, uh, peatland action, uh, when I first started, it was 50 centimetres of peat and or more. Is classifiable as, as, as peatland and, and, and eligible for restoration. We've in a recent year or so been looking at even 30 centimetres of depth to see uh, if that would then help with the restoration of the wider environment, the wider peatland environment and things. So the, the, there's it, it's it's a constantly shifting sort of perception of, of, of where and what peatlands are and, and what can be done to them. So that's just peatlands from my point of view there's other habitats in the outer everybody's like the macker uh, which is you know in some places in desperate need of help and, and protection and, and restoration and things so the yeah it can it can certainly there's potential certainly for it all to tie together um, and to have this sort of wider uh, landscape view but whilst looking at the individual habitats um, because you made a, a point about the water table level and other things and then it got me thinking that if you've got this depends on the scale you look at it because and the slope of the land and because mm. you're if you've got iron on a slope you're obviously less likely to have that water table but then again if you plant trees there it could potentially impact on adjacent land mm. you did have the water table in in terms of your so, well if, if the slope is a, is a peatland or a peatland habitat the sphagnum mosses can hold somewhere between eight to 30 times their own weight in water so a, a, a strong and healthy population of sphagnum mosses can actually be an effective tool in flood mitigation so yes sleep uh, sleep no that's clearly what's on my mind steep s slope steepness uh is is obviously something to be taken into consideration but the vegetation types that are within our habitats can also help uh, and there'll be natural tools against floods against other things that could come from climate change if a healthy and active peatland has a high water table it's effective against wildfires as well it'll slow the burn uh, and, and, and give breaks for for, for for fires and things that could come when we get drier periods through climate change so I, there needs to my, although my project looks at peatland action i do believe there needs to be this sort of holistic view looking at everything and, and taking things into consideration it's not just a case of i come in and say yes this this can be restored into peatland and away we go it, it needs to look at and see um what's best for that land that we're in at the moment it's complicated Thanks. always is always is <laughs> the thing. Um, well that does lead in to a point that came from one of the other sessions earlier in the week. I'm trying, oh, it was um, the North East session last night, and we were just talking about uh, community rangers. And it's just what um, the link might be if there's a spread. Say uh, there was community rangers across the Isles, and they were all linking in. How would that benefit 
the peatland and crofting work is that is a range uh, something that people that you work with al already or would that be something that could be built upon i'll jump in first uh y yes and yes uh it's definitely something that can be built upon rangers are usually out and about and have eyes on the ground a lot more than I can as one individual. So they'll be able to spot areas that are maybe eroding and degrading and we can then work together to find solutions to to, to put in uh, or uh, measures to put in for, for peatland restoration. So uh, absolutely, the more people that are out and about looking at their ground and keeping an eye on it and observing it as well, is the better for me as well, because they can get in touch and say, we've got an area that's degrading and, and going forward. So um, yeah in principle happy for for more rangers more more eyes looking at the ground and, and more sort of connections in that shape and form so donald you've unmuted so i'll pass to you yeah yeah i i, I would agree as well um i i think from a crofting perspective as well um this is moving off the climate topic i think but uh in relation to tourism as well we we see increasing conflicts between visitors and and crofters and having a having rangers uh, on the on the ground is an important part of that. But also a way of um, uh, linking up what crofters are doing and how that influences the landscape and uh, and reminding um, visitors and 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 local people as well that um, that the the landscape that they're enjoying is a is a managed one. Yeah, I think it was something that um, it did seem like just such a great idea in terms of the countryside, like a countryside rangers kind of thing. So every every ranger could be there'd be maybe six or seven or more. I'm not sure on how many rangers you need for each area, but if they're all working as a collective and they're looking at each of the the individual areas, such as crofting and peatlands. Uh, biodiversity, tourism as well, everything kind of links in together, really, once you get started on climate change and sustainability, it's it's just so wide. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to hear that that might be an option. Um, okay, I'm conscious that I've kept you both for a long time, but it's been such an interesting discussion. Uh, I'm just going to give one last chance for anyone to come in with a final question. No, that's that's probably for the best since we're at four. That's a two-hour session. So well done, everyone, um, for bearing with us and for contributing so well. And a big thank you to Ben and Donald um, for just stimulating such an interesting uh, chat. And it's something that we'll definitely take away and have to cover some of the points tomorrow with the MP and the MSP. So just to lead on to tomorrow, well, we've got a session. So it's the Community Climate Action Week has three more sessions. And that's um, one is tonight with Hosha there, and they're looking at uh, growing local produce, but also they've got their own uh, renewable project and a tree nursery as well, which is extremely interesting. And then tomorrow we've got a session at half 10 on uh, climate adaptation. And the final session is at one, the question time session. So if anyone can come along or is interested, please uh, get in touch or have a look on, on our social media, Community Energy Scotland. We'd love to have you come along. I'm seeing something on the chat. So just before I finish. Um, so Vanessa saying, I think the idea of Rangers and North East has come from Rangers recently employed in North East was so successful. So yeah, it, it does seem like it's been a successful thing across uh, different areas. Because I know that there's been uh, ones in Golson and Harris, I think North Harris as well. So yeah, something something to look at in more detail. But uh, yes, thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. And uh, glad that there was so so much interest in the crofting and peatlands. Thank you very much for, for all the questions as well and for the interactions. It was really good. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers.